All right, in the previous video, we talked about the ESR CM and when it was introduced a couple of years ago and the system it was all about in which you had a uh, expediter file or it was the equivalent of a screening file or a triage file, which was essentially a 25 tip with a constant taper 06 taper. And this file was deciding for us what type of canal we have. And we had at that time three different finishing files and those were sizes 30, 40, and 50, accounting for small, medium, and large. But a lot of you guys wanted to have a little bit smaller options. And for that reason, a size 2004 was also added to the final finishing file. So currently the ESRCM has four finishing file sizes, 20, 30, 40, and 50, and they're all constant taper or four taper preparations. So they create a much thinner preparation than the equivalent of the progressive taper reciprocating file, such as Wave 1 Gold. So the Wave 1 Gold is a progressive taper instrumentation system with creating much larger taper prep final preparations. And the reason for that is because that system is supposed to be matched with thermoplastic carriers such as gutta core and thermophil or warm vertical condensation that does require a much larger coronal taper in, a, in order to allow larger condensers to be push deeper into the canal or prevent the sloughing off of the gutta percha from these carriers. But since our system uses hydraulic condensation, which is a uh, bioceramic based technique and uses uh, one or additional cones as needed, accessory cones as needed, as the main method of obturation with the bioceramic filling in the uh, additional spaces, we came, kind of came to this realization that there's no reason to remove any additional uh, coronal dentin by having much much larger and progressive taper so that the equivalent of the uh, the end of sequence uh, reciprocating file or ESR CM files with the wave one golds are much thinner coronally and with this constant taper the size 20 was also added for those exceedingly small canals so that you want to only finish to a size 2004 so that is going to be considered an extra small canal so we now have 20 for extra small we have 30 for small 40 for medium and 50 for large canals as your final finishing file. So four nice finishing files that you have. You have also the screening file or the expediter, which is a size 2506 uh, uh, that could also be used as a finishing file in some specific cases as a um, uh, with a match with the 2506. So one additional file that was added to this along with the previous ESR uh, CM Scout, which was a 1503 file with a very, very flexible type of a um, presentation, was the addition of an austenitic file in this very same 1503 format that is going to give you a little bit more strength in terms of trying to gain length and going down the canal without having to deal with the excessive flexibility of files um, at, in this size frame, such as the 1503. So, now what I wanted to do is in this case based learning I want to demonstrate and showcase a, um, a maxillary molar that I recently did using this protocol this new protocol and uh, kind of share it with you but just to kind of tell you uh, the same basic protocol that I discussed in the previous video that entailed the use of the triage file, the 2506, to decide whether you have small or a large canal is the first thing that you do. If the 2506 reaches the apex within a couple of rhythm motions, what you have is a large canal and you finish that with a size 40 or 50, depending on how large the canal is. But if it doesn't reach the apex within a couple of rhythm motions, then you have a small canal. At that point, what you want to do is to first get the canal to a size 15 O2 or a 1503 in the case of the ESR CM Scout. And then you can finish based on how large the canal is with either a 20 or a 30. Now we also believe that most of the time you want to finish with a 30, but as I mentioned in a very small canal, you could finish with a 20. All right, without further ado, let's take a quick look at a case where I kind of uh, showcase the use of uh, this instrumentation protocol now to uh, finish up. So here is we have a maxillary first molar with a recent crown and this patient came in with diffuse pain in the right side of the face without any specific site of allocation. It was not really localized and so what we ended up doing is we had to take a little uh, CT and then take the CT in the form of a uh, um, you know, of a bite wing, so the maxilla and the mandible. And this, as you can see here on the uh, regular pan, we see that there's been a couple of crowns on the maxillary and then the mandibular, there are also some large fillings. There is a deep uh, uh, cratering type of a lesion on the distal of the 
second molar, mandibular second molar, but that did not seem to be the problem after doing the full vitality tests and so on, which you're supposed to do. We find out that the primary source of the problem is the maxillary first molar, and you can see here on this CBCT, on that axial section up on the top, this tooth had also a little bit of a uh, internal root, re uh, root resorption that was going on internally, and that usually is a sign of chronic infection and inflammation. And so we can see also from this image, and we isolate the mesiobuccal root, is that you do have a bifurcation at the apex on the MB1, and then the, the MB2 is present, but it does disappear somewhere in the mid root portion of this tooth, just based on the CBCT analysis. So we can kind of anticipate that ahead of time. So the setup that I use in these cases, as you can see here, is an orifice opener, as I always do in molars, and then number 10 hand file, then the expediter to kind of triage the case for large ones and the small ones. If it's going to be small, we're gonna get it to a size 15 hand file or the 1503 uh, Scout, which in this case, we're gonna use the austenitic one and then finish with a 20 or a 30. So this is a, a new crown and the new crown, this is actually a zirconia crown. So these are excessive, you know, exceedingly hard and that's why I end up using the, the Duracut bar that's in the uh, modern uh, access kit that we've developed at Rewild Endo. And um, that is the uh, bird that is used to get through. It does take a little bit of time to do that. So take your time and be patient so you don't end up cracking the tooth and or cracking the crown, if you will. And then as you can see, we get down, there is some calcification, especially in that area where the resorptive lesion was present. And uh, so we just kind of use the long Duracut now to just give a little bit of a flowing access preparation there. And on the paddle canal, as you can see here, I'm using the orifice opener here and the orifice opener. This is an, uh, actually a Martin Cedic or controlled memory, it's a CM orifice opener. And uh, it is going to uh, just give me some coronal pre-flaring that is important to have in a crown down technique to uh, make sure that our screening files and our additional files, the hand files that we're gonna use are going to be able to go down easily. So I, right at the MB1 level and here at the MB2, I oftentimes use my orifice openers, whether it's the endosequence orifice opener or in this one, uh, it is, uh, I use them almost like an explorer to find my MB2. And you can see here the MB1 and the MB2 were just, uh, we trough them. And each time the orifice opener is taking a little bite so that I can then just kind of remove that bulk of dentin. Ultrasonic is used to remove all the debris and make sure that all calcifications is removed. Now I'm using a number 10 hand file here with a with this concept that I've done in previous videos, what I call the uh, available length method, in which I'm just using the file, this is stainless steel file that will go and will let me know how much of an available length I have in which I can instrument coronally to that in a crown down technique in a safe way and, um, and proceed. So this is Triton and I'm using Triton now to add it because remember Triton contains both your decalcifying agents, your um, chelating agents as well as your disinfectants before I use my screening file, my the expediter or the um, uh, primary file if you want to call it, uh, equivalent to that. And you can see that it's getting engaged. There's a couple of uh, curves in there. That's why the file is coming out curved. So I'm using it in MB1 and the MB2 both times and this is used, remember ESRCM is a uh, counterclockwise cutting direction reciprocation action and I'm using it on my endosync plus with a 0.2 newton centimeter of torque on the OTR setting. So it kind of gets into that reciprocation motion right away as soon as it engages the dentin. You can at times push up the reciprocation action OTR setting to 0.6 and get even more action. So as you know, what I do in these types of cases, they have a whole protocol, as I've mentioned in previous irrigation uh, webinars, is that I add the, um, I do ultrasonics after cutting, then I remove, I use vacuum to remove the solution, and then, uh, and then add the Triton. Here I'm using the uh, ESRCM Scout. This is the austenitic version, as you can see, right after the original um, primary file, the 2506 the ESRCM went straight down to the apex and I'm measuring it and on the, uh, what's nice about the Endosync Plus is that it, when it reaches the apex, it stops. And I'm doing the same thing here now with just these light, without really pushing, very light motion on the distal buckle, it also went down to the apex. So I've established working length on the distal buckle as well. And you sometimes wanna do this a couple of times to make sure that you get reproducible points so that you're not having a false positive 
Also further very important to make sure that you have a dry chamber when you're doing that. All right, so on the distal buckle we have 20.5, so it's a little bit shorter than we had on the uh, paddle. And now we're going to do the mesial buckle. And you can see I'm doing very light kind of motions, gentle engagement without really pushing. And the moment you feel that it's kind of getting, uh, you're feeling resistance, that's the time where you want to stop and actually use a hand file. Now, some people may prefer to just use a hand file instead of this at the beginning. But I, I'm not a huge fan file user myself. I find that there is more problems that can happen with the hand files. But if you learn how to use these files um, properly with proper engagement time without pushing, as you saw, what we did is we just used the 10 at the beginning to get the available length. And then I use the uh, scout here to reach the uh, full length on the MB1. And we get the working length on the MB1. We follow the, the same thing on the MB2. And now here, I'm going on the paddle and getting the 304 down to the apex because um, as you saw on this one was kind of um, large, but I want to just make sure that the 3004 goes down to the end. So uh, I have the 3004 on the on the uh, paddle going to the apex. On the distal buckle, as you can see, after two rhythm motions, the 3004 is not down to the apex. So that that is a pretty tight canal, both on the mesial buckle and the distal uh, distal buckle. And you can see that each time that it's going down, the tip of the file is getting engaged quite a bit. So once again. After each uh, instrumentation, ultrasonics, vacuum, and add Triton. And now I'm using the 2004, and you can see the 2004 moves very nicely. And after uh, you know a couple of rhythm motions, uh, we are going to reach the apex. So the 2004 in this case is on the second pass is down to the apex on the distal buckle. So that is nice. So we have that. Uh, on the distal buckle prepared to a size 20 and, and, and on the mesial buckle now it's also prepared to a size 20. Now many people may prefer to just kind of fill these cases with a 2004. Uh, I am more of the older school of preparation. I like to see a little bit of a larger apical preparation. So I'm trying to see if I can get the 30 down in this case on the distal buckle. But the 30 is engaging pretty well meaning that it's actually the canal is kind of gauged to a um, 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 kind of a, it's kind of a thinner canal here. So I don't try to necessarily push the 30 all the way to the apex in all of them, but on the mesial buckle, it did go down to the apex. So that 20 created a nice path for me. And you can see that I'm taking the 30 down to the end. So I got 30 in the uh, uh, mesial buckle and uh, 20, um, 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 about 20 on the distal buckle, but 30 was kind of down to. And then on the paddle, what I decided to do, so I wanted to go a little bit larger than just a size 30. So you can see it's quite getting engaged quite a bit here. And the panel is reach on the um, size 40 is reaching the apex now on the palette. And, uh, and as you can see with a constant taper, we're getting nice engagement. So ultrasonics are used again. Now the MB1 and MB2, remember I was saying that at the beginning, the MB2 was disappearing and halfway uh, in the middle of the tooth based on the radiograph. And it was showing a little bit of a shorter working length on the MB2 in this case. It was kind of just like only about uh, 15 or 14 millimeters. Uh, so what I did is I just want to take a quick uh, x-ray of the cone fit and you can see that. So the cone fit shows us that the paddle root is reaching the apex and the mesial buckle and the distal buckle are reaching the apex too. I put a 25 on the distal because I had finished to a, the 20 had reached the apex and a, and a 30 was close to the apex as well. So I kind of went in the middle. On the mesial buckle, 30 reached the apex. So I just used the 30 equivalent. On the paddle, however, I, uh, even though the 40 went down to the apex, uh, it was kind of tight. So a 35 seemed to be a size that was going down to the apex without it feeling too tight. Remember, if it's too tight, then you don't allow room for the uh, sealer to escape back up around the cone and that could cause um, a little bit of problems either with overfill or prevention of the cone to reach all the way down to the end as the sealer will get trapped and prevents your cone from fully getting seated. So we go on and we just do a hydraulic condensation. And as you can see here is the post-op image of immediate post-op of the tooth. And you can see that that area where there was, you know, it seemed like the uh, MB1 was joining the MB2 and it was a little bit shorter. It actually was having a side exit as well 
going out, there's a little lateral canal going out on that side. And you can see that that area we saw at the apex has a small little lateral canal that is filled just with sealer in this particular case, with hydraulic condensation. And in a different angle, we can see that the uh, paddle canal also has a little bit of uh, bifurcation going on in it. And this bifurcation is filled with the cone and some sealer that is being pushed out. And you can see from the same angle here now that the uh, that little accessory canal on the this on the mesial buckle uh, is filled uh, also with sealer. And again, going back to the original image, we have uh, uh, this this tooth filled. We put in. Uh, uh, about four cones in this uh, size 35 in the palate, a, about a 25 in the distal buckle, and a 30 uh, in the mesial buckle, along with a 25. And this is just with hydraulic condensation. It looks like it was filled with uh, warm vertical condensation. So it just goes to show that hydraulic condensation does achieve a very good amount of hydraulic pressure. And it's much better to have a biceramic cement in these types of um, irregularities in the canal than having something that can kind of wash out, resorb, and, and um, shrink over time. So the ESRCM, now with the addition of a size 20 finishing file, as well as this additional 1503 austenitic version, so it's a little bit more... Uh, you know, it's a little bit sharper for cutting. It's a little bit less flexible, but at that size, it's still 1503. It still is very flexible, and uh, so as a result of that, it does. Uh, it's really a welcome addition to the system that helps make it more robust in terms of not only just addressing our kind of run-of-the-mill cases, but be able to also address some of the more difficult and challenging cases that uh, you as an endodontist, as well as advanced general dentists and restorative dentists are going to face clinically. So this is it with the ESRCM. Please make sure that you leave any comments you have below uh, in uh, the comments uh, regarding the system. If you have any questions, I'd be more than happy to, to help you. But these two files have now been added and they're already available for you guys. So we're kind of excited about the system. I'm, I'm a really uh, big uh, proponent of the system along with the blend, as you know. Uh, and, and I'll make another video where I kind of go over all of these different instrumentation systems that we've helped uh, develop a blast over the past 20 years and which ones are really assigned or designed for what type of a system, what kind of a case. So this video is getting too long. Also, before I finish, my friend uh, Ashley at All Things Dentistry sent me this little mug, uh, which I think is pretty cool because of Bertucci's classification. You may want to go check out his channel as well. He's a great guy up in Canada. So uh, for with all of this, that's it. Uh, for Rubel Dental, I'm Ali Nese, and until next video, let's save some teeth.